This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. When I think of the 2010s, I think excess. I think about shorter attention spans and high energy. I think about society as a whole looking like a child trying to use a new toy for the first time. I think about new forms of hate and anger as a result of that. But I also think about a resurgence of wholesomeness and togetherness. There are pieces of work that defined the decade without knowing it, like Kanye West's Life of Pablo, Fincher's The Social Network, Beyonce's Lemonade. But then there are those that came later in the decade that both knew how to reflect on the status of our world and knew where we were heading. If I had to choose one singular work that achieved that balance better than any other, I'd have to go with Paul Schrader's First Reformed. First Reformed, aka the better of the two Taxi Driver remakes of the last few years, is about a pastor who undergoes somewhat of a crisis after an encounter with an environmental activist and his pregnant wife. Sure, that's the synopsis, but First Reformed proved itself much more than that as it uncovers itself layer by layer, revealing its true nihilistic nature and becoming one of the most haunting depictions of modern society ever put to film. But before we get into that, Let's, uh, let's hear from our sponsor. I used to start my mornings by aimlessly scrolling through social media and catching up on things that barely caught me up. That is until I started using Morning Brew, a free daily newsletter running Monday through Saturday that covers everything from Wall Street to Silicon Valley. I'm able to get myself in the loop and feel caught up within five minutes of using it every morning. Traditional news is dry, dense, and if we're being honest, kind of boring sometimes. And Morning Brew keeps things witty, relevant, and informative. Just this week, I learned that Virginia made it illegal to use your phone behind the wheel for any reason and that the office got taken off of netflix and is only on peacock now like go figure in short there's really no reason for you not to use morning brew if you're interested in business finance or even tech it's completely free and takes less than 15 minutes to sign up click the link in the description below to subscribe to morning brew today Understanding First Reformed is to follow and be put in the shoes of Reverend Toller's crisis, so we'll start there. The film really begins with Mary coming to Toller about her husband Michael, who says he wants her to get an abortion. Because of where the world is going, because of the amount of destruction that's been done to the environment, he believes it's immoral to bring a child into the world. At this point in his life, Toller is already familiar with guilt from sending his son into a war that killed him and then destroying his marriage shortly after. So in a way, he's been there. But clearly religion helped him, and his general response to Michael is that his wife shouldn't get that abortion, and that as for his concerns about the environment, courage is the solution to despair, and reason brings no answers. But the more he talks to him, he kind of gets to a greater point that there is no solution to despair, and that despair and hope being held in your head is life itself. In short, despair is unavoidable no matter what you do, that's just life, and taking the life of someone else isn't going to help with that. Which, not the greatest thing to say to someone as unstable as Michael, but two important things happen to Tuller in this conversation. One, it's the jumping off point for another traumatic event that spirals him further into guilt, and two, it pushes his views towards despair into a much more objective sense. What he claims through religion at least is that despair is unavoidable, and in a religious context that's supposed to feel reassuring, but when looking at despair as something directly associated with climate change, something man-made that is long past a solution that feels like a ticking time bomb, that's when the crisis kicks in, even if Tuller doesn't fully realize it yet. Because that's a mixture of guilt for being a part of the problem, as well as a physical, realistic thing that religion can't solve. Tuller quotes Thomas Merton in the following scene, stating, Despair is a development of pride so great that it chooses someone's certitude rather than admit that God is more creative than we are. Which is to say, pride is the root of the crisis, and that makes sense considering what Tuller writes earlier in the film. For what is pretty much the rest of the film, we watch as Tuller spiral down deeper into this nihilistic behavior, suggesting that this is about climate change. Michael's legacy seeps deeper into Toller's own worldview. Choirs that used to act as a rejection of these ideas, a reassurance, now sing Neil Young protest songs. His own souvenir shop is looked at more as a part of the problem. Colleagues turn to enemies, his temper grows shorter with each scene. What starts as an environmental awakening turns instead into a spiritual one 
and while he does have this obsession with the destruction of our own world, there's an obsession with general destruction, including that of himself as he consistently damages his own body. And to me, that's this new form of prayer he speaks on later in the film. The film ends on, uh, let's call it a unique note. The camera, for honestly one of the few times in the entire film, starts to move, circulating rather quickly around Mary and a strapped up bleeding toller who just a few seconds earlier was gonna drink the toilet cleaner as they passionately kiss. Mid-song, the picture abruptly cuts to a black screen, we sit in silence for a few seconds, and the credits roll. It is about as open-ended as it gets. A lot of people hate this ending because there was no proper ending, others theorize that he died and this is a dream, others point out the very obvious biblical connections this as well as so many other scenes in the film have. My take? It I mean, I think it's pretty obvious he died. Maybe this is a dream and he went through with the toilet cleaner. Maybe he bleeds out to death from the barbed wire. Maybe those explosions did what they do. To me, it doesn't really matter how he died or if this was a real event or not. I'm looking at it as his last thought. What matters to me is the filmmaking and this choice for an ending. Because First Reformed had an effect on me that not a lot of movies have, a very intense one to be clear. I wasn't able to get this movie out of my head for months, and I still think about it every now and then these days, hence why I'm making this video two years after it hit theaters. It's not specific things I remember about it though, like the choir music or the gorgeous gorgeous inserts or even the unforgettable magical mystery tour sequence. No, what stuck with me was the panic, the anxieties, and the paranoia. If Schrader were to wrap this up in a bow with a traditional film ending, it'd be a disservice to everything this film set out to do. Because it was never about making a movie for Schrader, he's mentioned in several interviews that he set out to make a spiritual experience and he did so by creating a sense of participation for the viewer. This isn't just in the ending where we're left to answer ourselves what happened to Toller and figure out what's real and what isn't. It happens throughout the film. Many scenes only include a total of three or so shots, sometimes only one. He cuts to wides and tries to go as objective as possible with his filmmaking as a way of allowing the viewer to look at who they want to look at and focus on details that maybe aren't at the center of the frame. The film doesn't hold your hand at what to absorb, but it does invite you in. Um, but why? What's the point of all of this? Sure, it's cool that the film comes off as transcendental and that you can't stop thinking about it, but why? For a film that reads this hopeless, does this matter? Why did Paul Schrader really make this movie, and why does it define an entire decade? I guess we gotta ask what the decade was. To me, it was an anxiety-driven decade filled with ignorance. I know this is a silly claim coming out of a 23-year-old, someone who was 13 or something around 2010, meaning I don't have a lot to compare this decade to, but what I do know is that information changed between 2010 and 2010. 2019. Not just what that information was, but how we received it, how we reacted to it, and how we reproduced it. The internet, but more specifically social media becoming the norm that it's become, the separate universe that it is, that changed a lot of how we view ourselves and what we have access to. Whereas it used to be that we only knew so much, now we can know and believe whatever we want, whenever we want, and that's powerful, but damaging. Especially when you realize that everything you know that isn't right can't be fixed. And as far as how we view ourselves, that's constantly being reflected upon. Combine that with the ignorance you didn't know you had, and you're bound to grow a little anxious about everything. I don't know what I'm saying right now, to be honest. The more I write, the more I start to to feel like Toller, which I suppose is a great transition to a point I really wanted to make, uh, the journal. The film starts with the journal. It happens within the journal, really. And I'd argue this film is more about that journal than it is about this environmentalist awakening. Because the journal is about self-actualizing and recognizing pride. And this is a movie about a man who, the more he learns about himself and leans into that pride, the more he drifts towards a state of complete despair. John Katz wrote of Thomas Merton's views on despair where he states, Despair then is the complete absence of hope. As a mood it passes, it sweeps over all of us. As a final destination, it is dark and crippling. Despair, said Merton, is the natural development of a pride so great and so stiff-necked that it refuses to search for happiness, see it anywhere, work for it, or accept it. Despair is an arrogant thing, then, a rejection both of divinity and life. Which is where Toller finds himself by the end of the film. Schrader's views on the subject are extremely nihilistic, 
but the purpose of this film wasn't to necessarily argue for them. He's clearly not a filmmaker that acts like he has the answers, or that produces work for anyone but himself. He simply wants to express his anxieties towards the helplessness we face in a world too far off the deep end to save. And I don't completely agree with that, but I see where he's coming from. Reverend Toller is an exaggerated figure who, the more he knows about himself and the world he lives in, the more he falls into complete despair, like I mentioned. And Schrader successfully got audiences to empathize with a character like that and feel the headspace. At the time of writing this, the beginning of 2021, it'd be dramatic to say we're all in a sense a little like Reverend Toller, because I don't think we are, but I would be lying if I didn't say those feelings of dread haven't resurfaced because of recent events. The film asks you that question, can God forgive us? And nobody, not even Paul Schrader, really has a clear answer for that. But it also asks when, if ever, are you willing to open the journal?